Hey, everyone. About two years ago, I had an experience that changed my life forever. I was walking down the street in San Francisco on a really cold night, and I saw a woman sleeping on the sidewalk. And I asked myself why, in a city with so much incredible innovation and big thinking, why we still have people who are sleeping on our streets at night. And of course, if you've been to San Francisco, you know that this isn't an isolated incident. About 7,000 people are homeless here in our city. Um, and it's not because they want to be. The shelters and supportive housing programs in San Francisco are totally full. And after seeing this that night, I decided that I was going to do one thing to help and to use technology, my background, to make an impact. And so about two years ago, I launched handup.org. Through our website, you can read stories of specific people who are experiencing homelessness. You can donate money to them towards specific goals like housing, medical care, food, and you can send them messages of support through our system. We've helped over a thousand people and have raised nearly a million dollars through our platform in that time. We've helped people like Marvin, who was homeless here in San Francisco. He was a veteran and he was also a chess master. And when San Francisco shut down the chess games, his high school class found out about him. They were organizing their 40th anniversary reunion and when they found out their friend was homeless, they wanted to do something. And they came to the mayor's office, and the mayor's office had just heard, heard about us, and they referred them to Hand Up. And so we helped sign Marvin up for a Hand Up profile, and his high school class circulated around, read his story, and in the first week, they raised about $5,000 for him. The support that he got, not just the money, but the encouragement and the hope in the messages his high school class sent, helped him and his case manager get him into uh, temporary housing. And it also helped him get connected with other services that he qualified for. But that's just one story. We know that homelessness is so much bigger Three and a half million Americans experience homelessness every year, and 50 million Americans are living below the poverty line. This is such a huge problem, and something that government, um, of course, needs to interact with. And you know, I ask myself, what is government doing about this problem of poverty? And Jen is going to take on that very big question. Great, thanks. Um, so, you might think with 50 million people in poverty that we are spending less as a nation on the social safety net. We actually spend about 19% of GDP. The average for what they call advanced nations is about 21. We're totally in the ballpark. But with that trillion dollars, and that doesn't even include Medicare and Medicaid, so it's actually much bigger, we still have so many people in poverty. Why? I think it's partly by ha because of the way we administer these programs. And I want to share a couple of examples with you. This is how you would apply for CalFresh, which is our state's nutrition assistance program online. It's over 50 screens. It's several hundred questions, many of them confusing and intimidating. This is a system built by a large government contractor at the uh, cost of many hundreds of millions of dollars. And we spend about $90 million a year just to maintain the system. Now, we started with a Code for America team. These are developers and designers, professionals that take a year off. They worked with HSA in San Francisco last year. They built an alternative that works on a mobile phone or a tablet. A couple simple, clear questions. You sign with your finger, and you, are, you have applied. And now this costs orders of magnitude less to maintain, uh, and it's much simpler and better for the user. It doesn't have to be that way. And we'll have a slide in a second. <laughs> Apologies. There we go. Now, once you're on the program, you if you get your mail, we'll start to get snail mail messages like this one. And I'm going to read to you from it. Your benefits may end this quarter because they did not change as a result of the documents and information we received because it would have not resulted in a change in benefits. They say this three times in the letter. I don't know what this means. I've read the letters. But if you get this, and if you're lucky enough to get your snail mail, you will not understand that what they're asking for is further documentation. And if you don't know that, 
What they're actually saying is, your CalFresh benefits may stop at the end of this quarter. Please call the office. The fellows built a very simple text messaging system that sends you this text, and in the pilot, 40% fewer people fell off the rolls because of it. Now, why did they start with this very small intervention in a large, large system? It's because the Code for America fellows interviewed hundreds of people who were on food stamps. And one of the things they found is that moment when you're at the front of the line at the checkout counter and you slide your EBT card ready to take your groceries home and the EBT card doesn't work isn't just a moment where you're not bringing food home for your family. It's also a moment that's deeply humiliating. And they wanted to change that. Not only can these systems be less expensive, but they can show respect for their user because respect costs less. That's it's so bad hearing that and seeing that, <laughs> but I will say there is some hope. Government isn't all bad, of course, and especially at the city level, we're seeing uh, mayor's offices being very supportive of new innovation and encouraging uh, technologies and new solutions in their communities. This is, this is us, my team with the mayor's office here in San Francisco, and they supported us right from our, our start. But I think we're gonna need more than that um, to build new innovation and create new solutions. Like the traditional tech community has a whole ecosystem and pipeline, um, we're just starting to see an ecosystem and pipeline form around this kind of innovation. Incubators like Tummel and funders like the Impact America Fund that believes in using powerful business models to also impact low-income Americans. And I'm really excited to announce today um, that HandUp just received funding from the Impact America Fund. Yay! <laughs> and this support will help us continue to grow and iterate very quickly and test out new solutions unencumbered by the bureaucracy of government. One example of that, something we just launched, is gift cards, um, which citizens can give directly to a person experiencing homelessness in their community. Those cards can then be used for all kinds of basic needs, um, like paying for different bills or getting food or clothing. So what we're seeing is that our site and our gift cards are able to help engage the community and fill in uh, where there are resource gaps. So like for Marvin, HandUp helped bring him in and connect him with other systems. I'll be the first to say that he has now been in government supportive housing for the last couple years and Marvin actually just got a job and this is after he had been homeless on the streets for 25 years so I, I don't think that there is a dichotomy of we have to innovate on the outside or innovate on the inside the point that I'm trying to make here is that the way that we're thinking big about the future of technology and this is the future by the way <laughs> thinking big about self-driving cars and um, artificial intelligence. We need to apply that same kind of thinking, the same powerful tools of innovation, of business models and technology um, to create new solutions in poverty. And so we can't sit back and wait for the government to solve all these problems for us. Um, I always give the advice of you need to start small in anything that you need to do, but I think when it comes to poverty, we need to start thinking a lot bigger and taking big ideas seriously um, and looking at reinventing our, our social safety nets and all of the billions of dollars that we're spending on, on charitable solutions as well. We need to think bigger about fixing government too. So think about healthcare.gov. This was the president's signature policy initiative and we almost lost it because we couldn't put up a website that works. Now who fixed that website? It was a bunch of people who don't know anything about government, but they know about systems that meet user needs, not government needs. And these folks, some of whom are pictured on the cover of Time, they are really true heroes. Some of them worked 100 days straight, 20 hours a day to fix the site. There's a bunch more people like them now, uh, people who've stayed on at the United States Digital Service and 18F, which I am proud to help uh, found at the, uh, the White House. Um, public, uh, private sector entrepreneurs like uh, Yasha Franklin Hodge, who founded Blue State Digital and is now serving as the CIO of the city of Boston. There are 34,000 volunteers in the Code for America Brigade Network who are doing nights and weekends to help their local government do technology better. 
there are a hundred uh, now people who have gone through and done their year of service with Code for America. Some of them were the folks that went to Atlanta last year. Uh, and what they found there is that if you get a minor traffic violation, you will stand in line to clear that ticket for an average of six hours, which sounds inconvenient, but if it means that you have to take a day off work and you may lose your job, it's much more than inconvenient. And when you don't clear a ticket like that, a minor traffic violation can over time become a serious offense and you will end up in jail. There are thousands of people around the country who are incarcerated for ridiculous reasons. So now in Atlanta, you will get this when you get your traffic violation. It allows you to text your citation number and get help in resolving this without coming into the office or by making an appointment and being reminded when your appointment or your court date is, again, by text message. So we know some of our friends at the uh, Arnold Foundation tell us that if we can reduce the number of people who fail to appear for a court date, we reduce the number of people who are needlessly caught up in our criminal justice system and think about how important that could be. People think of us as taking, applying technology to these hard problems. Actually, a lot of the time we're removing technology. We're doing less. <laughs> uh, think about the um, system that is currently running the child welfare uh, process in California right now. We think we're taking this out to bid again as taxpayers, and the estimate is $1 billion. But we know that we can do better if we apply a different approach one that is data-driven, is user-centered, and is most importantly, iterative. We can get a better outcome and more, uh, save money, but most importantly, those social workers can spend those time with kids instead of doing data entry. So Rose and I, I think, are talking about somewhat different approaches, inside government and outside government, but I think we share two things in common, and one is that we don't have a resource problem in this country, we have a resource allocation problem. Sorry, I don't know who to attribute that quote to, but I think it's very wise. And the other thing is that we're not going to solve either of these problems if we don't all come together and help. Thanks very much. Thank you.